Uh, let's talk about some other results. So that's our main result. There are some other interesting results that we achieved. Uh, these are, most of these have been published. Some are going to be presented uh, shortly in, in uh, November at the Academy meeting. Uh, you know, it's not enough to show that you're successful at, a year, at 12 weeks. Uh, skeptics are gonna, still going to say, well, that's nice, but what happens a year later? Are the children still asymptomatic? Are the, are the, is the NPC still normal? Is base out still normal? So we did a six-month and a 12-month follow-up, and essentially we found that the vast majority of kids, 87%, almost 9 out of 10, remained successful or improved at, uh, at 12 months. So that's a very significant result as well. By the way, in the, in the, uh, no matter which group the child was in, even if they were in the placebo group or the pencil push-up group or the home computer group, they still remained in the, the same category, successful, 12 months later. Even the kids in the placebo group, which is interesting. The, another thing that we uh, published was a, a paper about wh not just what happens at 12 weeks, but what happens at four weeks, between four and eight weeks, between eight and 12 weeks, to kind of giving uh, the cl clinicians a sense of what to expect over time. And we have some important data in here. Here's the one uh, part I wanted to share with you. Up on top here, this is a graph of the symptoms of the child, the CISS, um, over time. And you can see the different groups. The first group, the white is the pencil push-ups. This is computer. This is office-based vision therapy. This is placebo. And the trend you can see is that symptoms improve more towards the end of therapy. If you took, looked at someone at four weeks, they really not that much of a change in symptoms. More of the change occurred at the end. But when we looked at signs, NPC, and positive fusion divergence, you can see most of the change in signs occurs in the first four weeks of treatment. Uh, so this is important information clinically uh, if you're working with a convergence insufficiency. No matter what treatment you're applying, home-based therapy or office-based vision therapy, you expect to see at that four-week visit a significant change. If not, you've got to worry about, do I really have the right diagnosis? Is the patient complying? So. Uh, this provides us with uh, some, some guidance about timing. We should be doing a reevaluation after four weeks. Uh, that's the appropriate time. The ab absence of any improvement clinically would mean that perhaps we shouldn't be doing therapy. We might have the wrong diagnosis, or maybe the patient is, isn't complying. If the patient's complying, we should see changes in NPC and positive fusion divergence. It also tells us to not be surprised if a patient, if we tell the patient at four weeks, you know, you're doing a lot better, the, the findings are improving, keep it up. And the patient says, well, I'm not really feeling that much better yet. You can say, well, based on a randomized clinical trial, we know it's going to take a little bit more time. So that's an important uh, finding there. Another thing we did in our study is we not only used the CISS, but we also asked uh, a six-item survey called the Academic Behavior Survey. And it evaluates parents' concerns rather than the child's symptoms, what the parent is feeling about the child. Here's what it looks like. These are the questions we asked the parent. How often does your child have difficulty completing assignments at school? How often does your child have difficulty completing homework? Does he avoid? Uh, does he fail to give attention to details? Does he appear inattentive? Do you worry about your child's school performance? And they answered never infrequently, sometimes, fairly often, or always. And we looked at this before treatment and after treatment. And this is a paper we published back in 2009, uh, and we found that children with symptomatic CI, with parent report of no ADHD, scored higher on the ABS, the uh, symptom survey I just showed you, when compared to children with normal binocular vision. So parents are more concerned about children with symptomatic CI than with normal, uh, children with normal binocular vision. We also are going to present, these data will be presented uh, by uh, Eric uh, Borstein, at the Academy meeting in November, basically we're going to show that the mean ABS score decreased in those categorized as successful or improved versus non-responder by, and you can see by the, the, these, uh, the, the mean change in the uh, ABS. It was significantly related to treatment outcome, so the conclusion is improvements in signs and symptoms of CI after treatment were associated with a reduction of problem behaviors and parental concern. This is a nice finding, it tells us there's more to just CI than making the child feel better. There's a, actually some functional significance in terms of what parents see as well. 
Uh, you know, one of the things we, we attempted to do when we first formed as a group is we wanted to show, we wanted to show that effective treatment of CI has potentially has some impact on functional performance in school, like reading. We've never, we haven't done that at this point. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but at least this shows that uh, parental concern seems uh, about reading and uh, schoolwork it seems to improve after effective treatment. Uh, another thing that we're, we're going to present uh, soon at, at the academy meeting is information about accommodation, accommodative therapy. Uh, there's never been a, uh, a randomized clinical trial on accommodative therapy. Optometrists talk all the time about doing accommodative therapy, vision therapy for accommodative therapy, saying that's very successful and effective. We really don't have any good data yet, but one of the good uh, things about the CITT is we gathered information about accommodation before and after therapy. So we're able to show, we were able to show after 12 weeks significant increases in, in accommodative amplitude in the office-based vision therapy compared to the other groups. But even the other groups, uh, computer therapy and pencil push-up showed some improvement uh, uh, compared to the placebo group, which only showed a change of about two diopters. The same thing for accommodated facility. We showed some significant changes uh, uh, as a result of office-based uh, uh, vision therapy and, and vision therapy in general. So the conclusion is that vision therapy is effective in improving accommodative amplitude and facility. And we're going to use these data to uh, kind of as pilot data to uh, drive a, a move to get a, a randomized clinical trial on accommodative therapy as well. So th these are, will be data that we can use uh, for future uh, studies. We did uh, some studies to uh, uh, make sure the CISS is a valid, reliable instrument. We published a paper showing that indeed it is, and it validated the cutoff of 16 that we've used in the past. Uh, the placebo study that we did, uh, Marjean Culp uh, uh, was the main author on this paper and showed that uh, uh, the placebo therapy was effective and it allowed us to maintain masking in, in the RCT. So this was an important finding as well. And uh, uh, here's some other information that, that uh, is critical for future studies. We uh, uh, applied the... Uh, uh, pa uh, patients of uh, children with symptomatic CI reported a higher frequency of ADHD-like symptoms uh, as measured by the Connors uh, ADHD uh, index, uh, suggesting that, the AD, uh, that uh, attention is something that can possibly change as, uh, as a result of uh, intervention as well. What may be more interesting to you are some of the other things that went on behind the scenes. So that's what I want to share with you now, uh, the rest of the time that I'm going to speak with you tonight. Uh, I showed you the results. But what, what were some of the things that happened over the years to, to get to this point? The first thing that I wanted to show you is that we learned it's very important to be able to take a hit. Here we go. That's the CITT investigator group. You see how we got up after that hit? You see all the hits that we took there? That's what we went through for about 10 years. And I'll show you some of those hits right now. So these are some of the things that we, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, the importance of experience in a randomized clinical trial, uh, interrelating with ophthalmology, pediatric ophthalmology and optometry interrelating, uh, the importance of getting assistance from uh, experienced researchers and persistence, and of course there's a lot of politics. Uh, these are things that none of us were really well prepared for before, and we didn't, I would say quite frankly, we didn't anticipate much of what we experienced, but it all happened and uh, uh, I want to review some of that with you. So uh, one of the things that we were criticized about early on, remember Lynn, uh, in all our submissions is that uh, Mitch Scheinman has never done this before. Lynn Mitchell has never done this before. We've got an inexperienced coordinating center. We've got an inexperienced study chair. Your scores are going to be pretty low. We, we just don't think you can do it. We don't think you can carry out what you, what you said you were going to do. And of course, we showed them that we, we could do that. Uh, they did give us a chance, uh, and uh, we carried that out. And uh, uh, you know, there, there is something to experience, but the good news is we we surrounded ourselves by uh, other experienced people. 
there were people uh, at the coordinating center with lots of experience. There were people that uh, I surrounded myself with that had lots of experience. So we were able to get the job done. This was the, uh, the key challenge of this study, uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and one of the things we uh, encountered right away was that there was, there was uh, uh, skepticism about whether this study could be done by optometrists without the support or collaboration of ophthalmologists. And in fact, uh, it, it's very, very important that this was a, a collaborative study. The, the, the chief concern from our standpoint and from the NEI standpoint was if we, pr if we publish a paper of a randomized clinical trial without any co-investigators who are ophthalmologists, will it be believable to them? And the answer is probably not. And as, you'll, as I'll show you, it still isn't uh, believable to some of them anyway, but I'll, I'll mention that uh, briefly. So uh, we actually uh, enlisted the help of three, uh, three ophthalmology sites. And uh, the NEI, after the study actually began, appointed a pediatric ophthalmologist, Rich Hurdle, as a vice chair just to keep an eye on me, uh, you know, just to make sure. Uh, that uh, no, no funny business was going on behind the scenes. Rich Hurdle turns out, turned out to be a great asset and, and still is in our study. Uh, and then here was the big hurdle. You won't believe the amount of time that we spent with this term. Now, if you're speaking to an ophthalmologist and you mention the term vision, that's okay, no problem. And if you're speaking to a pediatric ophthalmologist and you mention the term therapy, that's also okay. But if you ever put the two words together, you go from someone who's really happy like that to that. <laughs> and this, it's just a tremendous trigger word. Those two words together just make the ophthalmologist crazy. Uh, so what we had to do is we had to spend hours and hours and look at all the different combinations that we uh, thought about. Some traditional ones, uh, orthoptics, vision therapy, orthoptics, nope. It's got to be orthoptics, vision therapy, orthoptics first. Uh, vision rehab, all these different combinations. So eventually, we came up with this one. It didn't seem to hurt anyone's feeling. was uh, 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 vanilla enough to uh, get everyone's approval. It took many, many hours and compromise from many different, uh, from all sides. If you actually read our primary outcome measure uh, paper and, and count the times that this term is used, it was used 35 times in our, in our primary outcome paper. Uh, vision therapy orthoptics was referred to occasionally only because in the introduction we had to refer back to previous terminology that was used. And we snuck in two uh, occurrences of vision therapy. There are two occurrences. And believe me, we had to fight very, very hard to get those two in there. We didn't, you know, everyone knows we got it in there, but it, what it took to get in, and we had to give up a lot to get that in. 